Do you remember any of the horror stories you were told as a child? Well, I can, even some thirty odd years later, remember one or two that particularly curdled my blood back when I was young. And thus is the theme of tonight's stories. Two more from Dr. Creepen's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. Now, at this point I must say, the first story deals with some uncomfortable themes, including uh, domestic violence. I just want to give you a bit of a heads up, if that's not your cup of tea, then this story probably isn't for you, and I suggest go and look in my back catalogue for something that you might enjoy a bit more. Well, with that said, it's time for you to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. When I was young, my grandmother used to tell me stories about the island we lived on. She used to tell me about the fairies in the treetops, the spirits under the sea, the ghosts on the cliffs. But the stories that stuck with me throughout my childhood were the stories about the demon in the woods, the night maker. She used to huff and puff whenever I asked her to tell me the story. I was too young, she'd say. I'd have nightmares and keep her awake. She'd relent eventually, though. She always did. The stories went that there was a demon that lived in these woods. A thing who saw nothing in love or family. It would watch us from the dark, with hateful eyes for all that was beautiful. The people who lived near the forest had to be careful. The Nightmaker had a black soul, and he would drive all to despair if you let him near. So many tricks, so many ways to torture the people of the village, and no trick was played twice. Even survival was not enough. Meeting him even once would scar you forever, and you'd end up taking your own life. The one thing that always struck me about the Nightmaker was how purposeless he seemed. He had no reason to do what he did. All he wanted to do was show the townspeople how horrible the world really was. At the end, cowardly little me would be shivering, and my grandma would tuck me into bed. She'd kiss me on my forehead and tell me the world was cruel, but that she would be there for me. That old woman really cared for me. She really did. On my tenth birthday, she got me an old-timey radio. She knew how interested I was in tinkering with machines. If I could fix it, she'd give me a prize. And I think that was what attracted him. Three days after my birthday, after my grandma kissed me, I was tucked into my bed when I heard a noise. A tapping on the window. On my bedroom floor was a shadow of a man. I looked up to see him at my window. My father was smiling at me. It had been so long. So long since I'd seen my father's face. I'd forgotten what he even looked like. I thought he was dead. But at that moment, I recognised his smile. Come on, kiddo. We gotta go to church. I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't care what he was talking about. I got out of bed and opened my bedroom window. As I did so, he held out his hand, beckoning me to come outside with him. Maybe he was taking me to heaven? He held my hand tightly, and I climbed out. Making sure I was okay, he led us up to a path in the forest, bordering on our house. We walked slowly, but I didn't mind. I enjoyed the extra time holding his hands. As we headed into the trees... I heard a melody echo around us. A singing was coming from deep within the forest, in the direction we were walking. It's a nice song, isn't it? I must have nodded because his smile grew wider. It was getting colder as we walked, and the song was getting closer. The children were singing it, many together. The trees, they were growing more twisted as we walked, their branches becoming more hand-like like old men reaching out for me. And his grip was so tight. He kept smiling wider, stretching his skin as he stared into the dark. I gave 
slight resistance to his constant. Come on, John. We have to get to the church. Dad, my name isn't John. His expression didn't change. If anything, his smile got wider. He raised one long stretched finger and pointed in front of us. Look at the church. A cave in the distance. A cave in the middle of the woods. It led down into the earth. His cold grip pulled me as he led me as I lagged behind. And this allowed me to realize a disturbing fact. His legs were on backwards. Whatever was holding my hand, it wasn't human. I jerked my hand away from him, stumbling back, ready to run. Let's go inside the church, John. He turned to face me, and I screamed. The smile had grown and twisted the features of his face around it. His lips were ended around his eyes. So many teeth, in a jaw that curved at me. The horrible, grinning thing then reached for me. I turned and bolted down the path. I glanced back to see the thing behind me, following me, walking at that same awkward pace, walking with those twisted legs. I can see you. The tree branches snagged at my clothes, clawing at my skin as I pushed through them, leaving red marks as they cut into my face. The cold air turned into a rotted wind of stale air that pushed me back. It felt like hours, my time in that forest. Hours seeing that thing behind me. Hours hearing that tune. Hours struggling against the branches. All I could do was run. Away from the singing. Away from the thing coming near me. When the light of my house came into view, I was about to collapse. My bedroom window. My grandma's house. My safe haven. I climbed in and locked the window after me. Crawling into my bed, I pulled my bed sheets up and waited, hoping to go to sleep. Or wake up from a nightmare. Slowly, after a few minutes had passed, I peeked out of my covers to see a new shadow on my bedroom floor. It was there, standing outside the window. He was so horribly deformed now. A living, rotted tree smiling at me through the window, full black eyes and two red pinpricks in the centre. It tapped on the window with those long fingers. Let me in. I kept dead still. The finger pointed to the radio, and it cackled to life. Jack. Jack. John. Jerry. Come out, Jerry. Come out. You'll be safe with us, Jack. Come out. His voice. It was so wrong. It made me sick. Come to the church. Open the window. Open the window. Open the window. Go away! The radio burst into a mad chant. Open the window, 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 open the window. We'll watch you sleep, we watch you sleep, we watch you sleep. Go away! It stopped. For a moment. One day you're going to leave the window open, and I'll crawl in and I'll remember what you did. I'll make you remember too. Open the window, and I won't hurt you. It stood, dead silent, waiting. A melody came from the radio, the same song I'd heard in that forest, from that cave. Let's sing along, Jack. A horrible series of animal noises and shrieks echoed from the set. A woman in torture. A man laughing. All the while singing. It 
It was all such a horrible noise. My ears, they were being mutilated. Somewhere from upstairs, through that black cacophony, I heard a voice calling down. Jack? Jack, is that you? What's going on? The noises stopped. A frustrated voice came from the radio. Demonic howl. No pretense of friendship left. You're going to be nothing. Nothing. You know where I see you in ten years. I see you fat and dirty, hanging by a noose in your own room because you were so much of a failure. I was just sobbing at this point. Just, just go away, please, go away. Let me tell you the truth, Jack. The world is horrifying. It's empty and dark. In the end, it won't even matter if you came with me or not. The voices started to fade, as did the shadow on my bedroom floor. You'll see that, Jack. You'll see that. My bedroom door flew open as my grandmother came in. She hugged me, but didn't say a word. She stayed by my side till I stopped sobbing and went to sleep. That night I had a horrible dream. Something was holding my hand and dragging me through the woods to that cave deep within the forest. We went inside, and I saw the source of the singing. There were dozens of children all naked and chained, lying on the cave floor. Their mouths moved up and down. All their chains led to a hole in the cave floor. As I stared into the hole, my twisted father emerged from the depths and reached for me. I jolted awake, trying to get away from that cold grip. It turned warm, and I saw my grandmother's face in the morning light. My grandmother had fallen asleep in her chair beside my bed. She was still holding my hand. Every night after that, for a week, she would stay with me. She wouldn't ask me what had happened. It was just like she understood. I would never hear from my father again. Every so often, I'd be looking out at the trees bordering on our house. I'd see his face among the dead trees smiling at me. One day, you're going to leave the window open. After the first time, I jammed the window lock so it couldn't be opened. After that, well, life continued. Life went and hit me unprepared, like a turtle belly side up. Living was hard. I was alone a lot. After school ended, I went through the lowest point of my life. And I'm not about to go through my entire life story here, so I'll keep the details. But it was bad. Sometimes I could almost hear him. You know where I see you in ten years? I see you fat and dirty, hanging by a noose in your own room because you were so much of a failure. This is the first time I'm admitting this to anyone. But there was a moment... And I believed the words I had heard that night, that I was going to end up in a noose. Through it all, even when I left the house, my grandma would call me. She'd ask how I was doing, and I'd tell her I was all right. I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel like a loser, having my grandma as my only friend in the world. But it got me through the week. I got through a lot of weeks on those phone calls. It was around 15 years later, or 780 weeks, when I got the call. It was her doctor. She was sick. She'd been taken to the town hospital and was on life support. I got there within the night. It was there, on the white hospital bed. My grandmother let me know the truth. I was a child of rape. Her daughter, my mother, had been fifteen when she'd met my father. He was a man, a trusted man of the town, and she trusted him like an uncle. So it was easy to lure her into the trees, where he would defile her. 
For five weeks after, my mother didn't say anything. It was only when it became too obvious, when she began to show, that she broke down and talked to my grandmother. My grandmother wanted to call the police, but my mother begged her not to. My father was a horrifying man. She swore he would find her, even in prison, even in death. There was a fear so bad in her, she couldn't speak properly. She said he'd promised her he would take care of her son, that he had a place in the woods for them to live in. Against the tears of her daughter, my grandma relented. They got married. The wedding took place in an empty church in the woods. For the next four years, my grandmother didn't see her daughter. When she did, it was sudden. She was bringing in groceries when she saw a body lying near the edge of the forest. My mother was still alive, but just barely. She'd lost so much in that time. So much hair, 60 pounds, and three of her fingers. She still had me, though. She held me tightly, like a little life vest. Grandma had to pry her fingers open to get me some food. Over the next few hours, my grandma tried to get out as much as she could from her poor daughter. For half a decade, my mother had been dying in a nightmare. She wouldn't talk about where she'd been, only mutter about a church. She was broken in all of her spirit. Only the tiny spark had still resided in her body by the end of it. The spark she had used to escape with me. She left him when he called me by the wrong name. My grandma finally called the police. She locked all the doors, closed all the windows, and let her family sleep in peace for the first time in years. It was only later she'd learned the true extent of the monstrosity her daughter had escaped. The cops had found a cave in the woods, my father's church. So many bodies, so many children, all naked, all chained, all dead. They were emaciated, but not all had died of starvation. Their chains led to a dark pool, where they found my father floating, naked, and smiling at them. They electrocuted him. My mother would never stop having nightmares. My grandma would wake her to find her muttering in her sleep talking of how scared she was of him. The nightmare she had of his corpse standing outside her bedroom window, asking to be let in. Near my fifth birthday, my grandmother thought she might have been getting better. She'd grown quieter and more cheerful. There was feeling about her that her suffering was about to end. On my mother's birthday, my grandmother bought home a small cake to celebrate. She found her daughter hanging from the ceiling fan. She told me how helpless she'd felt that day. All her help had come so late. She'd made up stories to deal with what had happened. She knew she shouldn't have told me that story, the story of the Nightmaker, my father's story. But it had been her way of coping. She didn't know it would have affected me that way how it would scar me. She said she was sorry for it all. I looked at the woman who saw her daughter's rapist every time she saw me. I looked at the woman who had no reason to raise me, to not abandon me in the world. I kissed her on the forehead and thanked her for having loved me. There was so much I didn't say. How many times she'd saved my life. I hoped it was enough. I held her hand and stayed with her till the day she died, three weeks later. I don't want to say anything good about this place we were born into. It's such a horrible, cruel place to live in. The world was cruel, but my grandmother made it so much brighter for me. Her eyes were like two pinpricks of light in immeasurable darkness. The world is horrifying. That's the truth. But don't lose hope in each other. 
Sometimes it's the only thing keeping us alive. Don't lose your goodwill. Don't lose your soul. My friend Gavin was going to stay the night at my house. And almost all the times Gavin and I have our get-together, we order pizza. Usually we get it delivered, but this time we thought we'd just go and get it. I guess we just wanted a fresh sight. Well, anyway, enough backstory. Let's get on to the mysterious part of this incident. We weren't that far from the pizza place, so it shouldn't have taken that long to get there. We pulled out my driveway and started on our little journey. Gavin and I were just talking together when we first saw it. There was a man on the side of the road holding up a sign that said, Can you please pick me up? I need a ride. Gavin looked over and said, I am not picking up that guy. The guy looked to be... I can't explain it. He just looked messed up. At this moment, we were only about five minutes from the pizza place when we saw another hitchhiker. This one was also holding up a sign. And this one said, I said, pick me up. I need a ride. Gavin looked at me and said, Is this the Valley of the Hitchhikers or something? But I noticed that the sign seemed to be a little strange. Gavin, I think that was the same guy. That's impossible. I know, but it was him. We finally arrived at the pizza place. We both walked in, but Gavin was the one who walked up and got the pizza. While I was waiting for Gavin to get the pizza, I took a seat down by the window. I pulled out my phone to check my account when I heard a knocking in the window. I'll never forget what I saw standing at that window. It was that hitchhiker, but now I had a clear look at him. His face was all cut open. His brain was exposed. So was the rest of its body. I jumped up. I saw that Gavin had the pizza now, and I ran up to him and said, We need to get out of here, right now. I pushed him, making him run along with me back to the car. This time, I sat down in the driver's seat, and I pushed down on the pedal going as fast as I could. I was easily going over a hundred. Gavin told me to slow down, but I didn't listen to him. But one thing I forgot was that there was a sharp turn coming up, and the speed that I was going at, there was no way I could make that turn. I tried, but we flew over the cliff, tumbling all the way to the bottom. I was knocked out. I don't know when, but when I woke up, I saw that Gavin was still out. I called 911 on my phone. Luckily, that wasn't broken. But after I was done with my phone call, someone grabbed me and started to slam my head into the car. I tried to fight back, but whoever it was was too strong for me. After being thrown down onto the ground, I finally saw who it was doing this to me. It was that thing. It walked over to the other side of the car, pulling my friend out. It was walking back towards me, most likely to grab me too. But it heard the sirens from the ambulances. Before I blacked out, I saw the thing dragging my friend off into the darkness. I awoke in hospital, seeing my family standing around me. They were all so glad to see that I was okay. We all talked a little bit, and then I remembered Gavin. I asked my family if they also found Gavin. And what my family said next made no sense. My mum said, Who's Gavin? Now... This was strange because everyone in my family knew Gavin and thought he was one of my best friends. I explained to them who Gavin was, but they still said they didn't know him. Was all of this true? Does Gavin exist? Or did something really take him? Was that thing real or did I get brain damage and it made me remember my whole life in a different way? Well, I know now that everything I experienced was real because of the thing standing outside of the hospital window holding a sign made out of skin saying, I didn't forget you. I saw that thing standing at the window in the hospital. I screamed. My family was still there. I pointed at the window, but they said that there was nothing there. It seemed as if that thing was laughing. It seemed there was no escape. But I didn't lose hope. I jumped up from the hospital bed 
my family trying to stop me, to tell me to lay back down. My dad ran to get the doctors. I was running out of there as fast as my damaged body could manage. The doctors tried to stop me, but once I burst out of the hospital door, I started running, and I lost track of the doctors. Once I'd gotten away, I took a rest, but, but I thought that my life was going to be over, just like Gavin's, and that I wouldn't be remembered. I stood back up and started to jog, trying to not make myself tired. Once I found myself on the side of the road, I thought maybe if I could get a ride from someone, maybe it might buy me some time to think. I held my thumb out for what felt like hours, but it was probably only five minutes. The car finally rolled up beside me, and I jumped in without looking at the driver. And I said, No destination. Please, just drive. But the car didn't move. I turned to the person, about to say something, but then I noticed that I should have looked to see who was driving before I got into the car. It was that thing, still with that decomposing face and body. It had a huge grin on its face. I grabbed the door handle and tried to get out, but it wouldn't budge. I could see that thing laughing but not a sound was coming from its mouth. I then grabbed my head and started to beat it on the passenger side window. And the pure force that thing had could only be described as supernatural. I tried to break three from its grip, but the grip it had on me was too strong. On the three hit, the window started to crack, and on the fourth, an even bigger crack. The fifth, the whole window bashed open, and so did my face. I was knocked out. Once I awoke, I found myself hanging with my hands and feet tied, trying not to panic. But, well, once I saw that thing, I couldn't hold it back. I started to shake, but there was no way I could get out of these ropes. I could see the thing laughing once again, although still no sound coming from it. It started to walk slowly over to me, bobbing back and forth in a comedic style. I was terrified. Then I noticed there was a loose point in the ropes around my hands. I was able to pull them free. I tried to hide the fact that I was free until it was right in front of me. And then I drew my hands from behind my back and hit that thing as hard as I could. I don't know how I found the strength, but the thing fell down, hitting its decomposing head on the side of a table that had bloody tools on it. I then used my hands to untie the ropes on my feet. Once I was free, I started to run down a long hallway and burst out of a door. I was back outside now, and it was dark. I looked around and saw a road. I ran to it, and once again tried to get someone to stop. Once someone finally pulled over, I looked and saw who was driving. It was a normal-looking person, thank God. I jumped into the car and told him to drive. I told him everything, and he seemed to believe me. He told me he would drive back to his house, and he would try to help me. As he finished saying that, a huge knife came out from the man's chest. I looked over, and saw that thing in the back seat, holding a knife that was sticking through the car seat. It still had that huge grin on its face, and it started to pull the knife back and forth, cutting the man open even more. The man was surely dead now. I was about to jump out of the car, but before I could open the door, the car flew over a cliff. As we were falling, I looked back and saw that the thing was gone. The car crashed, and once again I was knocked out. Once I awoke, I started to crawl out of the car. I pulled myself up against a tree and finally started to relax. But there it was, that thing, that thing. It brought back the memories from when I'd first seen it, acting like it was a hitchhiker and taking my friend Gavin. But that thing, well, there was no way I could beat it. I just sat there and accepted my fate as it grabbed me and pulled me away into the darkness, just like it did my best friend Gavin.
Okay, okay, I know that first story was read by another channel a couple of days ago. Yep, so it happens. What are you going to do? I do make a point of only reading stories that have been submitted directly to me at Dr. Creepin's Vault, but of course, the authors are free to share their stories with other channels as well. And, well, sometimes two, three, four or more all end up reading the same story. It just happens. What are you going to do about it? Well, that's enough for me for one evening. I will, of course, be back again on Wednesday. Who knows? It might be a story that no one else has done before, <laughs> if I'm lucky. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it, if you like, on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>